Today, we will discuss the most abundant photoactive nanomaterial that is present on Earth, silicon. Do you know how silicon looks? This is a silicon wafer. So this silver metallic looking material is actually a single crystal cut from a so-called ingot. That's how they make silicon for the semiconductor industry. And they actually, they grow the crystals at very high temperatures, silicon derivatives from the gas phase. So they actually build these crystals up starting atom by atom. It is cut with a saw. So this side is polished. The back side is not so shiny. And of course, in one of the first lectures, I showed you an STM picture of silicon 111. So that is atomically flat. Right? You could see all the atoms. So this is pure silicon as they use it in the computer chip industry. This is a silicon panel. So you see, hmm, it looks totally different because it's black. Of course, the silver things here, this is actually a silver wire, it's a contact, but the active material is black. Now, how can that be? How can they turn a silvery material into something black? Well, that's due to the nanostructure. So that exemplifies how important nanostructure is. And we will try to talk about that a bit. We will talk today about black silicon. 20 years ago, silicon panels would look like this. So you see it is a bluish metallic-like appearance. The silver lines are again the, the contacts, but it's not black, it is bluish. These did not have nanostructuring. They were actually multi-crystalline, that's how you call it. But something happened, something happened, and you noticed, you must have noticed it, most of the silicon panels that you see on houses, they are black. Some people say it's also aesthetically more pleasing. People like black panels more, but they're actually also more efficient. It's really important. But so silicon has become black. How can that be? You may know that if you want to make a solar panel, you have to phosphor dope it, then you get N-type silicon. You have to bore dope in the other part, then you get P-type silicon, and you have to make a junction, a PN junction. The blue one does contain the PN junction, but the other one contains the black nanostructuring. And this is an example of nanostructured silicon. So you see, it's pine tree-like structures made out of silicon atoms. It's a surface treatment. And this is basically the, the idea. Before, silicon panels would be flat. So you would have reflection, pyramid-shaped nanostructuring of the surface. It sort of catches the light. So the light is reflected inside the nanostructure. So more light is absorbed. Actually, also the electronic properties can be slightly modified. But this is, uh, this is basically the simple principle. Now, uh, how can this be? How did they get to this? I think we basically owe it to Eric Mazur, Harvard University in the States. He's also quite, I actually heard his name first uh, in relation to peer instruction. Peer instruction is an educational method where you basically let the students teach each other. But he also came up with black silicon. Eric Mazur, professor in Harvard, he was actually studying exhaust, car exhaust. Every car contains a catalyst, it's made out of platinum. And one of the things he does, it does, is to convert CO into CO2, a platinum particle, a platinum structure. So here you see the CO molecules. This, but let's say this is the laser. There's oxygen present and there's CO2 coming off. So he was looking into the conversion of CO2 on platinum into CO2. And he did it with femtosecond laser. So with fast laser spectroscopy on the surface. He did that for quite a while, quite a while. And he was actually very happy with that, but still a lot of work to do. But he made somebody a promise. So at the Department of Energy, he promised somebody to look into semiconductors. They were interested in that, and he promised him, them to do this. He told his PhD student, go into the lab and find me a semiconductor. And an interesting guess, because CO on silicon, he knew that, it's not going to give a lot. Uh, imagine you're a PhD student or a master student, and the professor tells you, find me a semiconductor and find me a gas. Well, silicon is uh, abundant, so this guy, the PhD student, found uh, a silicon surface, and he found as a gas SF6. Yeah, of course, SF6, you know that from your first year of chemistry. 
Yeah, you had to apply the Phelan shell electron pair repulsion model to Lewis structures, and uh, FF6 was one of the octahedral structure. And of course, the solver has D orbits, so it has an expanded shell. This guy, he found a cylinder of SS6 and uh, a wafer of silicon. And so they did the same thing. They did it with these components. So uh, here you have, uh, just like I showed you, this silicon wafer. They put it somewhere in a vacuum. They put some uh, SF6, also some oxygen was present, and they hit it hard with a laser, with a femtosecond laser. And then the silicon turned black. And if you look at it with an electron microscope, you see pillars or well, this strange structure. This is the same. So this is the, you have the silicon surface. You hit it with 100 femtosecond laser pulses. So that's a very, very short pulse uh, with high power. And you have a surface and SF6 molecules present. So then something happens. This is the type of machinery that they use. If you ever been into the gas phase lab of uh, Vibrian Duma, where uh, Hernan uh, works, they have similar looking equipment. There's, of course, a lot of vacuum pumps, these kind of metallic containers to, to do spectroscopy in the gas phase. But you see here, and this is an optical table, this here, this here is a little thingy, a little, let's say, a metal piece. You see something metal. Here you see the, this is probably the mirror with which they shine the laser inside. Here you see a close-up of that same thing. Now, if you look carefully, here you see something black. So that's probably the area where they irradiated it. This is the sample. So this is, okay, a half a centimeter of black material that they made by hitting it hard with this femtosecond laser. You get a nanostructured silicon and it looks, well, okay, the base maybe is, uh, couple of micrometers, but of course the tip is very sharp. So this uh, in the 100 nanometer scale. So this is okay, one of their samples. If you just hit it on one spot, you get this pillared structure. So here is just a laser power and they measured the height of the spikes. And that if you turn up the power of the laser, that you get more, okay, more spikes, more structure. You can also, vary the pulse duration. You have all kinds of types of lasers. You have femtosecond lasers, they're more expensive. They have a very, very short pulse in time. You also have nanosecond lasers. They have a much broader pulse in time. And so that is important for the energy that you dump into a material. If the pulse is very short, it's much more energy in, in this very short period. So the, basically the heating or the reactivity is larger. The surface before the treatment, where they start, you see things start to happen after I think five scans. So basically they, they, they rest or scan the surface. You see things are more structured. It becomes more and more and more pillars are created. By hitting silicon with a femtosecond laser in vacuum with SF6 presence. You would not think about doing that just uh, for fun, at least most people wouldn't, but they did. And this is basically the, the idea. Yeah, so you somehow, you have a flat surface by hitting it with a laser with this gas, you create this structure, you create the nanostructure. Actually, there's a YouTube video from Mr. Mazur where he tells about this discovery. And it was really, go into the lab, get me a semiconductor and a gas, not CO, but something else. So if you are the student, you, uh, finding a silicon wafer is probably not too hard, but then selecting a gas, probably there's loads of gas, but how do you etch silicon? With a very, very strong acid that you won't, don't want to get over your hands, HF. So if you do silicon etching, like in the uh, computer industry, you, you, you use HF. So something with fluor that gives you the idea, oh, this could do something yeah? just from uh, experience and uh, knowledge about uh, etching materials. They could have chosen anything else, of course. Yeah, why does it form pillars? Because it reacts. And because you hit it with high energy, you actually, you create a plasma. 
But this is their idea. Their idea is I'm just telling their stuff. So this is the surface. This is SF6 molecules. You hit it hard with a laser. So you pump into the system a lot of energy. You ionize the gas. Eh? This sort of represents that you create, uh, okay, either F minus or, or F atoms, fluorine atoms. And the fluorine atoms, they react with the silicon. They can actually form um, SEF4 and go into the vapor phase. So here you see that reaction. And uh, here you see their, their idea. I would say it's maybe it's not proven, but this is uh, the concept. This is, uh, this is an SEF4 uh, molecule that goes to the gas phase. So in that way, you etch away part of the surface. You heat it by laser excitation short pulses and okay you somehow create these pillars but this is the rough picture that you just you selectively etch you etch a pillar like structure this is also representing the the light catching yeah? so basically the photons they are reflected into the nanostructure so they are not uh, reflecting outwards that's why it, it can absorb intrinsically more light Normal silicon, okay, it has a certain reflection, this line as a function of wavelength. And well, you can imagine that black silicon, it basically absorbs all the light. It does not reflect any light. So that's good because we want to absorb photons. We want to absorb light. And here we have the temperature. So if you shine a light, a lamp onto flat silicon, the temperature slightly increases. With black silicon, the temperature increases more. So that implies that more photons are converted into heat. They accidentally discovered a new technique to make a spiky silicon surface, um, which increases the light absorption. It actually also, okay, some of the sulfur is incorporated and also the absorption extends. So they actually also looked into uh, making night vision uh, materials from this. They could also control the tip size. The more power you put in the system, the sharper the tips become. The idea is this can be useful for photovoltaics, displays, night vision, and also maybe for biology. And they could even do it with germanium. And so this is one technique, just light and a reactive gas, you etch away. This is their method. And they tested it in making solar cells, but actually the efficiency of solar cells by using their methods did not increase from the story of the organic photovoltaics. You know that crystallinity is very important. So by making these tree-like structures, you actually lose crystallinity. You also introduce some sulfur and these are defects or you have recombination centers, but the panels are there. So their work, it triggered other people to nanostructure silicon and make it such that the efficiency can increase. So this is the basis, this is the start. This is the first uh, serious report of black silicon that brought it into connection with photovoltaics. And from that, a development has resulted. And now we're 20 years later and you see the panels everywhere. So it is, a, it is a big impact. And okay, the more I think of it and read about it, the more I think that actually this guy sort of deserves a Nobel Prize because it has a huge impact on the silicon industry, but also on our earth because by increasing the efficiency of these panels, we have more green energy. What do you know about focusing a laser? And so this is a, their optical method and we will discuss some other methods. What happens if you focus a laser? So here you see what happens to a focused laser. This is ionized air. So it's a little bit like lightning. Lightning is also ionized air. And there you see the projection. So that's like uh, the radiation that comes off. I would not go and stand there. But if you focus a femtosecond laser, and you can ionize air. And so this little white ball that you saw, that is the plasma. So you can create a plasma. So the more you focus, the more okay, extreme conditions you create. Uh, the, actually, how, how much the focus was really on the silicon, that I don't know, but it must be close.
So you can play with these conditions. And this is, this is from a recent review. Here you see that Mr. Mazur, he used something like this, 800 nanometer, 100 femtoseconds, uh, a certain power. This is with a nanosecond laser. With a femtosecond laser, you get these sharp spikes with also sort of a fluffy material on the tree-like structure. With a nanosecond laser, the, the shape is different. It's more like a tooth. And it's also more smooth. The width of the laser pulse is important because that basically tells you something about the energy that you dump into this reaction. Of course, it's very crude. One thing is the pulse duration. This is basically time, is the energy. And so this is the pulse of a laser. And at full width, half max, you have a certain time here. So this tells you. How does the pulse look? How, how short is it? There's also repetition rate, so how many times per second do you let it fire? Huh? So this is not continuous wave lasers, this is pulse lasers that they use. So that is a slight detail that people have to consider. So here you also see that if you do such a reaction, there's usually a threshold. You also saw that from the from the graph of the laser power. If you have a nanosecond laser, then the amount of energy that you can use above this threshold is usually smaller and there's a lot of heat made. So the shorter your pulse, the more energy of the pulse you can actually use for such a reaction or ablation or laser cutting. That's also very popular of course these days. So the pulse width, it is a big factor. That's what I just want to stress. So you can also visualize it like a, a wave pattern, but this is a short pulse, this is a broad pulse. The pulse width is also related to the energy distribution of the light. So that's represented here. If you have a very short pulse, then the wavelength is not very exact. If you have a very broad pulse, then the wavelength can be very exact. Can anybody tell me? how this uh, relation is called? Exactly, it's Heisenberg. So the pulse width and the energy or the exactness of the wavelength of the energy that's emitted, that's correlated through Heisenberg's relation. So here we have, uh, this is actually from a manufacturer, 20 femtosecond pulse, 15 nanometer uh, full width half max of the, of the energy. If we go to, 50 femtosecond is only 80 nanometers. The pulse width is related to the exactness of the wavelength. If you have a very, very short pulse, then you get a very broad spectrum. This technique, it was developed by Mr. Mazur. No gas, this is vacuum. So you don't need the SF6, you just need the laser. And here they call it a penguin-like silicon microstructure. So they're not pine trees, they're not tooth-like, they're Penguin, this is actually a picture of a penguin colony. Yes, I did not come up with this. So it's, it's, uh, you can control or you can modify the structure by modifying the condition. Here it is performed in air. So also if you do the same trick in air, you can also change the surface. It seems it's not changed as much as with the SF6. So just by playing with the energy of the laser, with the gas that is present in this chamber, then you can basically have different types of surface modification of silicon. This work, Mazur, it triggered. It triggered a lot of other uh, studies. Metal-assisted chemical etching, reactive ion etching, wet etching, plasma immersion ion implantation, even electrochemical methods. People have developed other tricks to control the nanostructure of silicon. And what are the applications? Well, optical absorption is enhanced. So we can think about solar cells. We can also think about night vision, night cameras or detectors of light. So not only creating electricity, but also just detection. So light is trapped. You have a higher contact area. So this can be interesting for catalysis, especially photocatalysis. Also, people have used this material as an antibacterial effects. 
surface enhanced resonance Raman spectroscopy. So you can use the tips to enhance signals. This guy developed a method with lasers to nanostructure silicon. He could make nice pillars. It was not optimal for, for solar cells, but it triggered a lot of other work. And that, of course, had the effect that materials did become successful for photovoltaic. This is the picture that I showed you before. So that's using a laser. These are other structures that are made with other techniques. They may look similar, but actually they are different. They also have different properties. And so this is indeed more like a pine lag. This may be like a, a bamboo forest. This looks like teeth. This here, it looks like pyramids. Very, very nice, regular pyramids. And here they are more sharp, the, the, the peaks. By using different etching techniques, we can control the surface modification of silicon. Etching with, with acids, and it's not physics, it's not purely physics, it's really chemical methods. And so in that way, you can control the surface, or you can modify the surface properties and the surface structure. Metal-assisted chemical etching. What does it make you think about? We've seen this before, or we heard about this before, didn't we? This picture here, eh? so this, it represents, we have a flat silicon, we have this silicon 111, we have a nice wafer. We put on top of it, noble metal nanoparticles. These little balls, they are metal nanoparticles. How did we make the coating of the stealth airplane? That's actually very similar, eh? So. There we had a surface with metal nanoparticles on top of it. And I'm not sure if we went to the details, but can anybody tell me how you would make uh, C60 or carbon nanotubes? Yeah, the basis is the same. We have a surface, we have metal nanoparticles, but we don't etch, we grow. How do we grow? We grow from C2 elements in the gas phase, uh, in a vacuum, maybe some uh, helium present. So we need, this is graphite, an arc welding machine, and we make a spark. So we create a spark between the two electrodes. And, okay, it's a little bit like an old uh, carbon lamp in 19... 20s, they have lamps that work in the same principle. So you have a discharge, an electronic discharge, like a spark in between these two graphite bars, and you evaporate the graphite. And you have to, even at that time, you had to move these graphite bars more and more inside to keep the lamp going. So you create gaseous C2 elements, C2 fragments. They go here and they. Uh, form a carbon nanotube below the nanoparticle. So that is how you basically make carbon nanotubes. Uh, without the metal particles, that's how C60 was made. C2 fragments in vacuum, they stick together, they form a cluster, and the cluster is going to, goes to the most energetically lowest point. People say that C60 is there in space, it's a molecule between the stars. So C60 is actually older than mankind, probably older than the Earth. I'm not sure about that, but definitely older than mankind. So it's not, C60 is not a human invention. It is a molecule that is somehow in interstellar space. So we are using the same trick. We're using metal nanoparticles as a catalyst, not to grow carbon nanotubes, but to etch. If you put the etching solution on this material, then you can etch away silicon material. So you create a pillar-like structure. So that is metal-assisted chemical etching. You make pillars by etching away, okay, with the hydrogen peroxide and other chemicals to make a pillared structure. So this is how you can visualize it. Basically, you have an oxidant and that uh, reacts with the silicon and the metal part particle sort of eats away into the silicon and the debris is going out on the top, from the top. But you also have charges that are created in the silicon 
but they, they dissipate. So it is like etching a little tunnel into the silicon with metal nanoparticles. So the, the metal, the type of metal and the size of the particle is then important for the properties. Just by putting a very thin layer of silver on the silicon and heating it, you can also make the particles aggregate or the silver form particles that have a certain size. So in that way you can, uh, by just putting a thin layer of silver on top of the silicon, and then doing the etching procedure, you can use the silver nanoparticles as the catalyst. Keep the silver there, then properties are different or you can remove it. So this is metal assisted chemical etching. And in that way, you can make these kind of nicely pillared structures. The length is really multiple micrometers and that diameter is uh, well, certainly less. This is a similar method where they have multiple steps also involving gold. So they can make a very regular pattern made out of silicon by metal assisted chemical etching, making something that is black silicon. So it's a different method, different from Mazur's method, but it works. You make a pillar structure and you put a catalyst on top of it. So in this way, you can make something that after reducing the oxide metal, you have a nickel catalyst on pillared silicon. And in that way, you can think about creating materials for water oxidation. And so you have silicon, black silicon coupled to something like uh, titanium dioxide to oxidize water. And in that way, make new catalysts. This is a sensor. So basically it is like a transistor, like a field effect transistor. So you basically accelerate the electrons that are created here. So it is a, ver a very, efficient way of detecting photons and the nanostructure then increases the absorption, but also increases the wavelength area that can be used. Night vision, for instance, for the military, it is very interesting. There are also uh, electrochemical methods. So here you see that uh, in HF with some electrochemical coil, they can make a similar pattern into a silicon wafer. They can even combine it with illumination or with lights. So in that way, all kinds of new methods have been developed to control the nanostructuring of silicon. This can result in different applications and in better solar cells. So that is, it's also, it's of course very crude. Eh? It's not uh, an elegant method, but this is reactive ion etching. The wafers, they're in a Pyrex tube, a container, and it is exposed to radio frequency power of 30 megahertz. So basically it is like a microwave. You put these wafers into something that is, well, I would say similar to a microwave together with reactive gases. And in that way you create a high density plasma. It is not a focused femtosecond laser, but it is a plasma. So it is very reactive and this etching eats away the silicon in a particular manner and makes a nanostructure. So this is reactive ion etching. These are then forms or reports, black silicon solar panels. And this here is 22% from 2015. This is a research paper. It's not a report from industry. And you see that this is the nanostructure. It's also, well, this is really mind boggling. So it's interdigitated back contacts. So that is something that is also, uh, there are all kinds of steps. One of them is to nanostructure the surface and yes, but the other thing is to modify the contacts. So you see here that all the contacts of this device, they're on the back. Now that's weird, isn't it? So in this way, people nanostructure surface and we have a different contacting way. So that is also something that you may be able to, to see on the roofs of houses. In the beginning, I showed you one of these panels with all these metal stripes, but then you have front contacts. That's this one here. This is metal contacts at the front. That is well what you would expect. But somehow 
people have developed materials or modules that are back contacted. So this one here has the PN junction on the contact, all the electrons in the holes are collected on one side. You don't have this sandwich with the plus and the minus, but you have interdigit um, exchanging plus and minus contact that are all located at the back. So the active surface can be much larger for the real panels. So that is another uh, new development, back contacted solar panels that has the potential to increase the efficiency, especially of the, of the active surface. So in that way, there are all kinds of tricks in development to make them better. And nanostructuring the surface, that is very, very, new and interesting development. Dye sensitized solar cells are intrinsically nanostructures because they're built up out of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. Organic photovoltaics, it's a nanoscopic interpenetrating network, so it's also nanostructure. So also a gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide is actually also made from vapor phase deposition. It is an extremely thin crystalline material only like um, um, less than 100 nanometer thick. So it's also nanomaterial, but it's not nanostructured. That's really flat. But we can have these new ways of contacting. We can also play with the composition. So here they use silver to fill the areas between the nanostructure. So in that way, you can modify the conductivity and you can play with the composition of your materials. And this looks a little bit like the needles of an STM. So it is extra sharp way of producing a nanostructured silicon. And there you see that it is hundreds of nanometer long and less than 100 nanometer size tip. Now this sort of looks a little bit dangerous. Eh? Like you, you could uh, hurt your hands on it. And that's why people have thought about interaction with bacteria. You see that from this nanostructured silicon, a lot of applications have developed, not only silicon solar panels, also night cameras, and also bioactive materials. So here you see, or you're supposed to see that the bacterium, uh, this here isn't a bacterium, it is sort of caught between the tips, so it's, uh, it's not gonna survive. Here it is punctured. It is punctured by the tips of nanostructured silicon. Mm, you would not think about nanostructured silicon as a uh, biocompatible material that is very easy to apply in antibacterial media, but it's possible. We also see here that they have made a pillar type structure, coated it with titanium dioxide, and there they can do uh, generation of so-called reactive oxygen species. So that is the same as in uh, anti-cancer treatment with porphyrins in, in humans. Uh, if you inject the porphyrin, it goes to the tumor. There, with light, you can make reactive oxygen species. Here they make reactive oxygen species like uh, uh, single oxygen or superoxide radical anion to kill bacteria. So with the pillared silicon surface, coated with titanium dioxide, they can kill bacteria. So it is a different application of this nanostructured material. This is the normal absorption spectrum or active region of silicon. So if you have a standard silicon solar panel, then at about a thousand nanometer, the absorption stops. So the solar spectrum goes on, it's more broad, but the band edge of Silicon solar cells is roughly a thousand nanometers. You also see it starts absorbing at around 300. There are uh, other materials like uh, indium gallium arsenide. So in the lab, we have a fluorimeter, so something that can detect emission, but it can also detect with a special detector emission in the near infrared. So we can monitor the emission for instance, of single oxygen at 1,270 nanometer. So for that, we use an indium gallium arsenide detector. There's also germanium detectors there. But if you modify the silicon, 
and you make the black silicon, I think especially with the optical method of Mazur, then you can extend the absorption. You can make it stronger yeah, by using this reflection trick, but it also goes all the way up to something like 1700 nanometers. So you can detect photons in that area. And that is also very useful. In our lab, we have different detectors for this area and that area. So you have to make a switch between uh, the equipment. You have to change something. So you could, in principle, monitor the whole spectrum from 300 to 1700 with one detector. That is very, can be very interesting. But also for uh, night vision. Uh, so you may have seen that uh, Mr. Mazur was actually uh, financed by the by the military. People not only uh, do nanostructuring, but they also try to combine it with microstructuring. So we have seen that for the lotus effect of the plant, that is self-cleaning uh, surface, that is microstructured. But then on top of the microstructures, there are nanopillars. So there, here they try to do something similar. This is an optical microscopy picture. So here you see the microstructuring, but on top of that, there is a nanostructure. So you can also for the silicon, you can try to combine two effects, microstructuring with a nanostructure. You have seen some of the start, the work of uh, Eric Mazur. The other material is from actually two recent, recent reviews from 21 and uh, 14. They represent an overview of all the methods that are available to nanostructure silicon. And this is what I want to tell you about black silicon. The message is that we can take a material and use various methods to make a nanostructure that changes the properties. The properties are then, okay, influenced by the nanostructure, improving light absorption or the, the range of light absorption. It's of course, it's a very, very important development. It has huge economical uh, consequences. If you have binoculars, it works in the visible part. Yeah, then you can uh, view from a large distance, you can see stuff or people. If you want to be able to see things at night, you have to look at, okay, heat or long wavelength. If you have a uh, detector, Okay, instead of using your eyes and lenses, you can use a silicon detector that made, is made into a, a screen, uh, like a little computer screen. Thereby, you can, okay, you have these heat cameras, right? So heat is also like a, well, longer wavelength radiation. So in that way, if you make uh, a detector that can detect photons around this area, then it can be useful for materials, for uh, like binoculars that uh, can work at night. With indium gallium arsenide, I believe that there is no nanostructuring. Like gallium arsenide, it is a very useful solar cell material, but to make it is too expensive. So they use it for space applications. Now also indium gallium arsenide, it is a material, it has to be crystalline, but to make it is too expensive to apply it for solar cells. What I know, they don't apply nanostructuring, so far anyway. Of course, it is interesting because in principle, if you would do that, you could make this curve higher and maybe even broader. So of course it means that anything that you have any catalyst, any photovoltaic material, any application, you should think, okay, can I change the nanostructure? How could I do that? And how will it change the properties? How can it improve the properties? And also for catalysts, it is uh, very, very small platinum nanoparticles have a higher catalytic activity than a platinum surface. So uh, definitely it is worth thinking about it anyway. But how you, okay, I don't think they have done it, also not for gallium arsenide, but it will change the properties. So it could make things better. But how to do it, that's, uh, that's a big, big uh, trick. Of course, I've basically given you an overview of all kinds of weird tricks to control the nanostructure. 
we have seen, okay, the physics of phase separation in organic photovoltaics, you don't, well, it is hard to predict the phase separation. Of course, crystallization and also phase separation, you can describe it quite accurately with physics. So the physics of crystallization or the physics of phase, phase separation that is known, people are just working on that. So you can apply their models, but, but as a chemist, it is not easy to predict the nanostructure that is formed by just adding chemicals and co-solvents and spin coating. But it's a good question. Can we nanostructure indium gallium arsenide? There are relations to make with uh, organic conservation. Yeah, there is, there is. Okay, so one thing that we've seen in organic photovoltaics is that we need these molecules to crystallize to form crystalline domains. Now, in silicon photovoltaics, you, you have only crystals. But eh, we saw today that if you hit it with this laser, you make a plasma, you make these strange tree-like shapes, then you lose crystallinity because it becomes amorphous. It reduces the efficiency. So you need to make nanostructured si silicon that remains crystalline, that doesn't become fluffy or doesn't incorporate other materials. There are a lot of people, and also people will present, I believe, on dye-sensitized solar cells. So dye-sensitized solar cells, for me, they are basically uh, non-structured. They don't have a lot of crystallinity. So I would imagine that if you look at organic photovoltaics, silicon, gallium arsenide, and dye-sensitized solar cell, that that is the one that will not have crystalline domains and it will limit the efficiency intrinsically. And so it's also, maybe it's difficult to see the connection with all, between all the areas, but uh, that is basically related to these aspects. Yeah, so we have atoms, we have ions, we have molecules. We can make them as chemists, but we can use them. We can use them to form structures. We can use them to form super microstructures like host gas systems, we can try to make larger structures. And these larger structures that are, well, they, if they are nanostructures and they still have, for instance, crystallinity, then they can have very good properties. But so we have, we have the building blocks. We have, we know all the atoms, we know all the ions, we can make molecules, we can make molecules interact, and we can do the next step to make the interacting molecules do something in a macroscopic world.